and to Bishop Donna Fozad, a true apostle of God, from whom many churches have been born across this nation. Ministries that I've just really blessed. I always remember Andre then, from right here. And his wife, Nora, a white, mighty woman of God. Amen. Amen. And to the ambassadors of Christ. Y'all may be seated now. I'm, I'm going to take my time, but we won't be here too long. That means I'm not going to open my Bible. I brought my notes. If we open my Bible, I preach for over an hour. If I use notes, I can do it in 40 minutes. So I'm going to use notes tonight, just for time's sake. And I'm going to talk about how to make it rain. We had a conference called Refreshing Word Conference. Refreshing Word. And every now and then, if you really want to be refreshed, you need rain. So I'm going to talk about that. Y'all, if y'all ever hear me preach this message again, please don't say, my goodness, Dr. Hunter sure messed up. He was talking about the late, next, time, next time I preach, I'll be talking about Elijah and talking about the rain. He held, held up the rain, how he brought back the rain. But that's another time. So I'm not going there this time. I'm going to another whole place on it. So if you ever hear me preach the message again, I'm talking about how to make it rain. Don't get mad at me and say, my goodness, that ain't what he said the last time. The, um, we're living in a time in this nation that other nations watch. And even in Africa and other places, they take their cue. I learned that blacks did not fight apartheid in Africa. The Africans didn't fight it until they saw blacks over here stand up for their own civil rights. And it was there that I realized, oh my goodness, if we don't do things right here, it impacts the rest of the world. Now let me gut, be gut level honest. Right now, we are off kilter. We are off kilter. And the only way that I can think about getting us really to make this message sound like, you, you know, I like to just preach for one. If I can, if I can reach one person tonight, I'm just as happy as I can be. Because I'm saving my soul. You know, I always say that whenever I preach, there's only one person I'm trying to save, and that's me. But there's somebody listening tonight that's going to need to hear what I'm saying. But not only that, there's some people around this nation that need to hear. And, and thanks to the mighty man of God, there's people around the world that get to hear what he's going to say. They get, you know, they, they, that's the beauty of, of the internet and all these wonderful things that's going on. But there's a little thing called relaxation te te technique that you have to use every now and then. And we have a fellow named Jim that had to teach it to us because from one of the people that had one of the major heart attacks in another sermon another time, y'all. Already spoke been dead four years ago, but I'm still around for a while. But there's a little thing I still have to do. And it's called relax every day and then. Because you get too wound up. And in order to relax, one of the best ways to relax is first tense yourself up. Get real tense. And then you ease off. You see how they do it. You know, you have to think it in your mind. It's going to tense my hand. And then you ease your hand off. And you can feel the relaxation come. Same for your jaw. You tense that jaw right up. And then it ease right on off. So in order for us to talk about a time of refreshing, first of all, I got to tense us up tonight. When you have a drought, that's when you know you need some rain. And rain is refreshing. And there is a way to get rain. I'm going to just talk about one of them tonight. There's, there's a way to get rain. But first of all, you got to realize it's a drought. See, in America, is a very peculiar place. Because in other places, when they have a drought, people die and drop dead. North Carolina went through a drought some years ago, and ain't nobody dropped dead. But it was a drought. Couldn't water your lawns. I mean, that big inconvenience, you know, all that kind of little stuff. But there comes a time that there's a drought in the land and people don't realize it's a drought. 
In fact, they act like the weatherman. Well, it's a very nice sunny day today. Oh, the sun is looking so beautiful today. We are doing so great. Now, day one, day two of it being a nice sunny day is all right, but a week of sunny day, you, might be, you, might, oh, you still might be bragging. A month of sunny days, now you're going to have a problem. Two months of sunny days, now you've got a major problem coming up. You get three and four months of sunny days, now you get six months of sunny days, you got to admit something, you're in a drought. I don't care how beautiful that sun is shining, how nice it is outside, everything, the bottom line is, you got some crops that ain't going to grow because you ain't got no rain. And if we're ever going to have harvest time, you have to have that rain. My grandma, I'm going to have my wife to sing a song for me right before I start off here. But my grandma used to sing. And me and my cousin Larry, I was born on a farm, a little farm in Goshen Hill, South Carolina. I'm just a little old country boy, you know. But on that farm, there'll be some times that it would get real dry. They would plant the cotton. Cotton was one of the crops we grew, and we grew corn. And you always rotated your fields. One year you have cotton on, next year you have corn on it. You know, you rotate your fields. Amen. And at the same time, there was always one field every three years you gave it a rest. Amen. And every seven years, there was a certain field you had to make sure, the biggest field you had to make sure it rests. There were things that, you know, you grew up on the farm learning. Amen. But I remember those times when it looked like there was no rain. Corn was not growing. Amen. Cotton wasn't growing. They had a vegetable garden out back. It wasn't doing very well. You could always tell by the tomatoes and the watermelon. Amen. No rain, no watermelon, no tomatoes. Everything going real slow. But my grandma had a way. She was part Cherokee. And grandma still had a lot of engine in her. And whenever it wasn't raining, you know, and everything, and I could see my uncles and everybody getting nervous. It ain't been raining, ain't been raining. See? Grandma would start her little Indian dance. She'd be back to the background. And I go call my cousin, Larry, Larry, Grandma, get ready to pray for rain. Because <laughs> we had seen it before. So Larry would come running over, we come around us, two little boys, and we sneak it. We got a little sneak in the back house because she back in the back room. And she's singing this little song. Oh, Lord, send rain. Oh, oh, Lord, send rain. Now we have planted, waiting for the harvest. Oh, 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 Lord, send rain. I mean, Grandma be having that thing going. But after a while, boy, me and Larry, we know we're coming from. So we go going outside. And sure enough, looking out over a field, you could see the rain coming. And Larry and I was always impressed because we always said, well, where was the cloud? Where was the cloud? Where was the cloud, boy? We could hear Grandma. That's right. Grandma risen. Oh, Lord. Feel like the whole house was shaking. That one, but, all of, but that rain and what Larry and I used to do, you could see that rain coming across the field, kicking up the dust. And what Larry and I used to do, we used to run. We used to run towards the rain. And I tell you, when it was 90 some degrees out there in South Carolina, the hot, that rain felt so good coming down on you. That was refreshing. It was refreshing. And in all the years I lived, I never saw a time that my grandma's prayer didn't work. Grandma knew how to make it rain. And me and Larry, we got old now. We still think about that woman doing that mess back there in that room. But now as I'm older, I'm beginning to realize something else. There's a drought in the land. Sometimes it's more of a spiritual drought. But Christians still think it's nice and sunny outside. Come on, Pat. Do the Christian National Hymn. Blessed assurance. Because we know that Jesus, he's mine. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but he's mine. Hallelujah. Glory to your name, Jesus.
blessed assurance. Jesus is mine. Oh, what a to sing that chorus again because this is my Hallelujah. 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 You know, the, the bishop was out at the end. Y'all usually let the, uh, the guest pastor say a few words. But when it comes to the end of this thing, let Pastor Bobby Fulmore, Elder Bobby Fulmore from Fayetteville, North Carolina, let him have the final word there, okay? And I'll sit on down after I finish now. Elder Fulmore is one of the most respected pastors in North Carolina. And he heads a coalition of pastors in St. Paul. And he works very closely with the coalition of pastors in, in favor of North Carolina. Even though they act up sometimes. He ain't never acted up. 
And uh, he's one of the real humble men. Can you show me the pictures of the family? See, Jesus said this in Luke 21. He said, take heed that you do not be deceived. Many will come in my name saying, I am Christ. The time draweth near. Go ye not after them. But when you hear wars and commotion, be not terrified. For these things must first come to pass. But the end is not by and by. Then he said to them, nation shall rise against nation. And kingdom against kingdom. And great earthquakes shall be in diverse places, and famines, and pestilences, and fearful sights, and great signs shall there be from heaven. But before all these, they shall lay hands on you, persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and the prison, being brought before kings and rulers for my name's sake. They shall turn to you for a testimony. Can I see the pictures of the famine? This is what's going on in the world. There's people that are starving. People that are going hungry. Keep them moving if you got more. Just keep them moving. And the thing about the, the famines, they're heartbreaking to see. And here in this nation, we really have a trouble just relating to it. This is stuff that has been going on this year. I'm not talking about reaching back years ago. I'm talking about here we are in 2014 and this is going down. You won't see these pictures on the newscast. You won't see a lot of stuff. Now you're going to hear about a little war here, a little commotion here and there. But when Jesus said these things are coming, he's trying to let us know that it's, the end is near. But it's not quite. What that means is that we then have a little time to deal with. Now what is also interesting is saying Jesus is the one that told his disciples, um, he said before all these things, they're going to lay hands on you. Persecute you, delivering you up to synagogues, into prisons, being brought for kings and rulers for my name's sake, and they shall turn to you for a testimony. Now that's what Jesus told his disciples, and guess what? He was right. Before the end, every one of them were persecuted, prosecuted, heads cut off, put in prison. They had some bad stuff done to them. I'm saying this because there comes a time that Jesus tells things that are very intense. Because he wants you to know the reality of what's going down. Now the next time I preach, I'll bring some real nice pretty pictures with me. When it shows about the heavens, I'll show you what the universe looks like. And they got some glorious pictures now. They got some things out there that look so... I mean, they got one that looks like God is sitting on a cloud headed back. I mean, it's just... Some of the things that are in the galaxy is just outright beautiful. We'll see those next time. But you have to get an idea of just how bad things are. Are we ready for the movie? Now we're going to try this film now. That's what I love about young folks. They know how to do this. One of the things that's going on here in this nation and it need to be put in perspective. Y'all saw the pictures of the children dying up there from the famine. These bees represent all of the American soldiers killed in the American Revolution, the Civil War, World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, and the current war on terror combined. But each of these bees 1,000 soldiers sacrificed their lives out of honor, duty, and patriotism. Each bee represents over 1,000. Each of the bees you're about to see also represent 1,000 human beings whose lives 
were snuffed out. But these people did not die for any noble cause. They were killed simply because someone wanted them dead. And someone else was hired to kill them. Every one of these bees represent 1,000 defenseless babies who have been killed in America abortion clinics since 1973. The only crime these children committed was being in the wrong place at the wrong time. Each bee, 1,000 dead. Today, these executions continue to be carried out at the rate of over 3,000 every single day. More than all the wars combined, even before my lifetime. Folks, if you thought that famine was bad, you realize America has a drought. America has a drought. Now, there's a way to turn things around. See, what has happened, heaven is shut up. There's, there's, a, there's a reason heaven will shut up. There, there's a reason heaven can be shut down. Take heed to yourselves, this Deuteronomy 11, that your heart be not deceived. This is God speaking. And you turn aside and serve other gods and worship them. Then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up heaven. Let me say it right. He shut up the heaven. That there be no rain, and that the land yield not her fruit, unless you perish quickly from off the good land which the Lord giveth you. Now, I read that from the Old Testament, and you have to understand what the Old Testament does. The Old Testament is a shatter of figure. It's, 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 just a, it's just a, it's just a, it's just a type of the, what is for real. This is Old Testament. So I want you to understand what he said. And he said, he said, I, I want y'all to understand something. He's talking about something that really happens now. God was letting them know, if y'all act up on me, want them. He let the children of Israel know, you act up on me, want them. I guarantee you, I will shut up heaven. You ain't getting no rain. Y'all know how, y'all know how I'm fighting over talking about Elijah right now, but I'll fight it on all. And when he does that, the land will not yield its fruit. And not only that, you can perish. In a real drought, people perish. The Old Testament figure, let, let, let me just use an example. Abraham and Isaac. Isaac carrying wood, climbing a mountain, a figure of Jesus carrying a cross to Calvary. In Genesis 22, it says this, Genesis 22, I'm starting at verse 6. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering, laid it upon Isaac his son, and he took the fire in his hand and a knife, and he went, they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, he said, Here I am, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for a burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for a burnt offering. So they went both of them together. Now let me tell you how literal this is. Everything about this is a type of Christ. We know it. Every one of us in here have that revelation. We know when that little son, here he is, Carrying that wood was typifying Jesus Christ literally one day carrying a cross. 
That little boy was climbing that mountain with wood. Jesus climbed the mountain of Calvary with wood. But what this Old Testament story, as real as it was, and it was real. They're not talking about something that was made up, but they got a lot of theologians out there talking about, well, they made... no, no, this stuff actually happened. They didn't have a TV camera and all that stuff to record it for you, but the people that wrote it down, they wrote what they saw, and they let you know, and they kept a good record of it. And they show you they weren't biased, that when they wrote good things about David, they wrote good things. When David messed up, they said about the best things he did, too. So the Bible is uncompromising with the historical things. So this is real. But there's a realness to it that's greater than the realness that's seen. That little boy carrying that wood represents something far greater than a little boy carrying wood. But look at what the words in that thing are really saying. Abraham said, when that boy asked, I see the wood, I see the fire, everything in here. Y'all know I feel like talking about the fire and the wood and everything, but we'll be here for hours now. So I don't know if we get re- everything, in the, everything in that scripture has a meaning. That, that cut, that cut. But main thing right here, Abraham said, my son, God will provide. But I want you to notice how this verse is go. This, I'm, I'm using King James Version here because I like how it just translates so literally. When you look at it, a lot of people like to get into the Greek part, but King James translated just did it right along the lines. Of boom, boom, bam, bam, boom. He said, my, he said, God will provide himself. I want you to think what this scripture is really saying. It, it's more literal than people realize it. It ain't just saying God is going to provide. It's saying God is going to provide himself. He's going to do it. God's going to step in. Where is the lamb for the day? God is going to provide himself. A lamb. And it's literally almost called God himself lamb for the offering. And it says they both of them went together, the father and the son. And y'all know the Holy Spirit up that fire. Let me stay away from it. <laughs> but understand what that scripture is saying. This scripture is literally saying Abraham even though it's just a little scripture talking about something that happened, it's really painting for you a much higher reality. It's just a little, just a little tip, just a little shadow of what really was going to come up there. Abraham says, my son, God will provide himself a lamb. This thing was saying something very literal here. It was saying God's going to put himself in that position he actually going to die for you, son. They went together, it says, father and son. South Corinthians makes it even better, but makes, makes it plain. In the fifth chapter, 18th and 19th verse. All things are of God, who have reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and have given to us the ministry of reconciliation. It said, to wit, God was in Christ. Reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespass on, and have committed unto us the world of reconciliation. That whole thing in the Old Testament, that whole thing in the New, wham! But it's a reality beyond our comprehension almost. For the law, Hebrews 10, 1 says, that the law having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices which they offer year by year continue to make the commerce they are unto perfect. But once again, I'm just the only part that I'm talking about this says the law, he said the big as the law is all the things, it's just a shadow. It's just a shadow. Hebrews 9, 89, the Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into holiness of all was not yet made manifest. While it's the first tabernacle was yet standing. And I mean, if you only have a thing of the tabernacles, everything in there, everyone would tell you that tabernacle, wow, did it represent something real. But it was an earthly thing, but what it represented spiritually, which was a figure for the time being present, 
in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that would make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. But it was a figure of the time present. In case you think Abraham was crazy, Hebrews 11 explains the bread. By faith, Abraham, when he was tried, offered up Isaac, that he had received the promises off by his only begotten son, of whom it was said, that in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Everything, once again, is just pointing right back to it. By faith that he offered up Isaac, for God so loved the world. Gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believe it, y'all know the rest of it. Won't perish. But they'll be able to live forever and ever and ever, everlasting life. When Abraham offered up Isaac, the book of Hebrews tells you exactly what he was thinking. According that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from whence he received him in a figure. It's still just a figure. But for the reality for that father, he believed if he went ahead and followed through and was to kill that child, God would still raise that child right back up. God let his only son die on Calvary's cross God Raising back up. Our mystery is so great. People still fighting with it today. Still fighting with it today. But this figure of what happened with Isaac, I'm just trying to let you know, everything that's said in the Old Testament, that thing is just a figure. Now Deuteronomy 11, remember what I said in 17, it said, and then the Lord's wrath be kindled against you, and he shut up the heaven, that there be no rain. In other words, when this thing is talking, once again, it's talking about a figure. Now, he's literally talking about shutting up heaven, and you're not getting rain. But let me tell you what it's talking about for real. It's talking about shutting up heaven. Let me tell you how plain Jesus is making it in the 24th chapter. Heaven and earth shall pass away, he says, but my words shall not pass away. But in that day and hour knoweth no man, because the disciple won't know, wait, when is this in time? When is it? He said, no man knoweth, not, not the angels of heaven. He says, but my father only. But as the days of Noah were, so shall be also the coming of the Son of Man be. For in the days that were before the flood, they were eating and drinking. This 24, verse 38. Mar marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and knew not until the flood came and took them away so shall also the coming of the son of man be let me tell you Jesus is talking about the time that God shut up heaven we look at it and say wow he poured out he opened the heaven door because it rained and flooded now let me talk about what he really shut up that day Genesis 7 says this Verse 15, it talked about Noah and all of them. It says, they went into Noah, talking about all the animals and all these things, went unto Noah into the ark, two and two of all flesh, wherein is the breath of life. And they that went in, went in male and female of all flesh, as God had commanded them, and the Lord shut them in. Wait a minute, y'all listen, I mean, people skip that verse sometimes, they don't understand what that... I remember an old pastor once telling me, old bishop, he said, he said, you know what? I'm sure people had a lot of other boats. I'm sure about now somebody else had built ships. I'm sure they had things. Why didn't those other ships survive? Why didn't those people, why didn't those boats survive? He said, one difference, because when it came to that ark, it was God who shut the door. It was God who put the seal on it. When Genesis says, they went in, Male and female commanded, and the Lord shut 
him in. The Lord shut that one. But let me tell you, when the Lord shut Noah in, he shut a whole lot of folks out. I want y'all to hear me now. And he did this literally. But that literally is still just a figure. It's just a shadow of what really is. That's the scary part. Because that means when God shuts up heaven, somebody ain't getting in. Now if you're in heaven, you don't have no problem. Amen? Amen? <laughs> You don't have a problem at all. But if you're not, when he shut Noah in, he shut a whole lot of wicked folks out. But why Noah? Why did Noah make it? In the Old Testament, under the time of law, there's a beautiful verse in there. Genesis 6 and 8 says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Genesis 5 said, God saw the wickedness of, 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 of man that was great on earth. Every imagination of thoughts of the heart was only evil continually. If that doesn't mind you of the day. If it doesn't mind you of the day. We live in a state right here. They said, we would like marriage to be between one man, one woman, just as God. Just as God wanted. The state north of us follows suit. We want that too. And who would ever thought, knowing what God think of men having sex with other men and women having sex with other women, knowing that God does not like that at all, period. Nor what an abomination it is. There's folks that still want to get done. And even though our state passed it and other state passed it, what they do, they can fight anyhow. They elected an attorney general. People voted for the man to defend the Constitution of Virginia. And then when the homosexual said, no, 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 we don't want that, and, 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 we, don't, we, don't, we don't want that, that's not constitutional, that's not right, that's not right. That's against us, that's discrimination. Try to pretend like they're like the same thing of being black and it ain't. But by them doing that, they found a judge that agreed. And the very attorney general that was supposed to represent the state and represent the people refused to even represent the people. But that's not the first time it happened. The leader of our nation did the same thing. When marriage came under attack, he decided it was unconstitutional for marriage just to be between a man and a woman. I mean, that's come from the leader of this nation. Did his attorney general defend it? Through the court in a big prison because the court was trying to figure out, wait a minute, my goodness, if both sides, if you ain't got nobody defending it, where's your case? See, things are getting very wicked. Wars and rumors of war, and y'all saw those bees. So all those millions of babies. 50 million in this nation alone put to death. And they've come up with all kinds of ways of doing it. When man's mind gets this wicked, God does not like it. And the Bible said, repented the Lord that he made man on earth. It grieved him at his heart. And the Lord said, I will destroy man who I created from the face of the earth, both man and beast and creeper things, the fowls of the earth, for it repented me that I made them. It says, but Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I want you to understand, that's a type and figure now. Everything is happening. Because when God literally did, a whole lot of folks drowned. 
They did. And I'm saying to you, that was just a shadow of what is to come. Because a lot of people, they reach this point now where, well, you know, God is so good. Surely he wouldn't want to destroy that many people. Surely he wouldn't. Please, if you're going to be a Christian, do your best to become up and be as close and pleasing to God as you can. But whatever you do, don't try to make God into a regular man. Don't try to make God a human. He's already done that for us with his son. That's already been done. But we can't make him fit our pattern of what we think. Maybe you can't let a whole lot of folks burn for all eternity in hell. There's something worse than hell they call the lake of fire. Even hell and death end up there. Maybe you can't do it. But I'm going to tell you, God can. See, everybody say, well, you know, God can do it, God can do it. But boy, when it comes to that, we think God can't do it. You'll be surprised. You would be surprised. There's a man in here. Donald Fozard is one of them. Brothers here, let me tell you, man. You married? You love that woman? If you came home and some other guy had grabbed your wife and was getting ready to hit her, how much Christianity would keep you from whopping that guy? Not at all because you be being like God. You will look after your bride. Amen. Amen. <laughs> I'm being honest with you. <laughs> but y'all remember the little lesson I did some time ago? Can I just repeat it again real quick? The biggest compliment ever paid to God says God created man in his image. Always do this little thing. Because I want you to understand just how high God is going when we talk about types and figures and all these things. Picture of me on my driver's license, my little North Carolina driver's license. That's the only license I halfway took a decent picture. Most of my pictures look like mug shots. It's an image of me. This is a type of me. It's a figure of me. And if somebody looked at it and they saw me again, they would probably recognize me. License give a little thought to it, but let me tell you about me. I can jump, do my little run around, walk cool. The main thing I can do, I can kiss my wife. Mamish don't know how to jump, doesn't know how to run, doesn't know how to walk. It has never kissed my wife. I love my wife. Mamish does not know what love means. Before I married her, when she was my best friend, you know how I finally figured out I, I, there was more than just friendship between me and that girl? We went to Bible study together, we went to church together, we almost both got saved by together. I mean, we, we were going together. And I remember one Sunday, some other guy picked her up for Sunday school. <laughs> I had to go to the elder. <laughs> I said, Elder Mac, he said, what's wrong, brother, huh? I said, I got sin in my life. He said, what is it? I said, I'm jealous. <laughs> We're in the church, you know, they say confession, false, you know. So I, I was honest with him. I said, I'm jealous. He said, what happened? I said, some other guy picked Pat up. Picked up for church. He said, oh, is that the right guy? I said, no, not at all. He said, what do you think happened? She ended up with I said, that'd be a mess. He said, now, Brother Hunter, he said, if you saw a friend get ready to make a mistake or something, wouldn't you warn them? If they were coming around the curve, there was a big pothole, a pit hole. Wouldn't you warn them? I said, yes. He said, then how much more 
Shouldn't you stand for the one that you love? So I made sure I picked Pat up next Sunday. <laughs> and before she got out of the car, I said, listen here, Pat. I said, I got news for you, honey. I got feelings for you, and it's more than just friendship. <laughs> and my wife can cook. That sister can fry some chicken, y'all. I love the smell of it. And when I eat it, my image has never tasted, nor has it ever even smelled my wife's fried chicken. It's just an image of me. It's just a type of me. My image has never been jealous of Pat. I could go on, but y'all get what I'm saying. You see how high I'm above my image? And if we are the mere image of God, then what is the real thing like? His nostrils are so sensitive, not only can he smell past chicken, he can smell sin. And when that praise team was up here singing and the choir was singing the praise, that little young fellow playing there, the piano was over there jamming down, he could smell the praise. Oh, do you have love? We have no idea of the intensity of the love that he's facing. We are just an image. And if we have passions and we have feelings, if there are things that we can love and if there are some people we don't like, think what God feels when he says he don't like somebody. My ways are higher than your ways. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. The type, the shadow. Now let me get back and bring it on to the end here now. The Bible says this, Noah found grace in a land that was so wicked and so much mess was going on. If you really just really, 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 really want God, if you really want to be refreshed, guess what? He will find you. But not only that, you find grace. And that grace, it says, second, second Ephesians, for God who is rich in mercy, for his great love wherein he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, have quickened us together with Christ. By grace you are saved. Have raised us up together. You remember we're talking about that little fellow? Oh my goodness. I said Abraham believed we'd be raised, but God has raised us up together. made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus, that in the ages to come he might show to see the riches of his grace and his kindness toward us. For by grace ye are saved through faith, and not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, and not of works, lest any man should boast. So 2 Corinthians 7, 13, let's get on down here, and I got two more chapters to go, and we'll be about finished. If I shut up heaven, and there be no rain, if I command the locusts to devour the land, if I send pestilence among people, if my people, which are called by my name, shall hum, and y'all know the scripture. But let me tell you what we got people doing. We got people doing the prayer part. We got people doing the, the uh, seeking his face part. And we got some people trying to remember, but let me tell you what the problem we got over here in America. Is that very first of my people called by name were humble. That's what has called heaven to shut up. Now you got to understand when God says, when I shut up heaven, he is literally talking about, I am going to bring a drought. I'm going to bring a drought. And the bad part about it, some people still think it's sunny weather. Down here they talking about me and Mary, me and over the nation killing all these little children off. Oh my goodness, and you go on the internet, you can find some of the nasty stuff you've ever seen in your life. Amen. And then if it ain't bad enough, it's getting worse. Already. They got pedophiles. Do not want to be recognized as a disorder. There's now a move so that men now, three men, 
can marry two women and they all be together. There's a move aside that not lower the age of sex with children to eight years old, but they want to eliminate the age altogether. This nation is in trouble. Now the bad part about it, somebody in here helped us get like that. I'm talking about somebody here in the church tonight. I'm talking about somebody listening to us on the other side by internet. Somebody helped us get here. You want me to tell you what happened? I was telling the bishop what happened with the black churches. In 2008, God shut down the prayers of black churches around this nation. God shut up heaven and people don't even know what happened. They have no clue it happened. You know what happened? Let me tell you what shuts it down. I already told you what can open it up. Grace can open it up. But what shut it down? Proverbs 16, 18, 19 say, Pride go up before destruction. A hearty spirit before a fall. Better is to be of lowly spirit with the lowly and divide the spoil with the proud. And they got these things I call gay pride. They saying it in your face. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Ye all, ye be subject to one another and be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud and giveth grace to the humble. Let me tell you what happened in 2008. We had people in this nation who voted for a man to become a leader of this nation only because his skin was this color. They did it to make a name for themselves. And not only that, they were happy when he got elected. They were proud of what they done. Knowing that God says God resists the proud. The Bible says the younger submit yourself to an elder. Let me tell you what it says. It's trying to tell you you have apostles in the church. You have the prophets in the church. You have the bishops and they try to warn the people. And instead of you listen to it, they, they, and they don't just get around the pulpit and tell you how to vote. They just tell you, listen, if a person don't support God, you don't support them. If God says this and a candidate is saying that, you go with God. Folks, like, you know, in America, you don't have to tell people how you vote. So I won't tell you how I vote in most elections. I will tell you, the, I will tell you this, though, so you understand where I'm coming from. One presidential election... My wife ran for president. Did she campaign? No, she didn't. Why did I say she ran? Because I voted for her. I knew one day I'm going to be standing for the judgment seat of God. And when I saw what was there, I said, mm, I know my wife is closer to what God wants than this. Some people say you threw away your vote. No, I didn't. I just watched it out for my soul. And yet there were people, especially black people in black churches all over this nation, that just because a man looked like he was black, they got their people out. Broke my heart to see them shut down service on Sunday morning so people could get out and vote and go from church. Broke my heart to see them go see a, go, go see a candidate who was in the crown auditorium, knowing Jesus Christ, the King of Kings, crown. I'm going, oh my goodness, can people see it? And now we have a current president who said that marriage between a man and a woman ain't right. Anybody should be able to get married. Y'all just wait till they start trying to get dogs married. United States Supreme Court didn't help. They got it wrong with the Dred Scott decision when they said blacks weren't, weren't people. The last court case was lost when two lesbians sued a Christian photographer. This just happened a week or so ago. Sued a Christian photographer in New Mexico for not taking their wedding pictures. Now let me tell you something odd about New Mexico. In New Mexico, they don't even allow same-sex marriage. It's not even legal there. And these two women, they found other photographers that said, yeah, we'll take your pictures. 
But did they select them? Nope. They found somebody who said, I'm not doing it because I'm a Christian. And they went all the Supreme Court and all Christians lost that case. Folks, I'm telling you, that's one step away from the doors of the church. And why did it get there? Because somebody voted for a man because of this. You went against God because you wanted to make a name and be proud of yourself. You want to live in a time of history. God resisted the proud. Likewise, you young, I said, you submit yourselves to your elder. That's what I'm saying. When your elders say something, I don't care if it's your older daddy who's a Christian, if it's a pastor, if it's an elder in the church, if it's a good, solid, walking upright deacon in the church, if it's one of the mothers in the church, I'll tell any young person, listen to the mothers of the church. Listen to them. Submit yourselves. For God resists the proud. But here's a key. Give it grace to the humble. If you want to crack open the gates of heaven, it's really not that hard. All you got to do is humble yourself. You have to go for the grace. If Noah could find it in a wicked world, so can you. James 4, 6, my last little scripture for the night. But he giveth more grace. And you know what that scripture, when that scripture in James 4 starts off, it's talking about where is all this wars coming from? Where all this fighting coming from? Not it's coming because you're warred and lusted with your members. That's in James, the same place where the Bible says, Jesus says, there's going to be a lot of wars going to lot of James said, where does that come from? Somebody got something and somebody ain't, and they want it. James 4, 6 says, he given more grace. Wherefore, he said, God resisted the proud, but give grace to the humble. Oh, do you really want it to rain? Do you want to be refreshed? It's easy. You got to be humble enough. And I wonder if there's one person tonight that have humble enough to realize, oh my goodness, I helped put somebody in office who's bringing this nation down and has caused God to shut up heaven. I want to know is that somebody just want to come up and just repent for doing it. Somebody who didn't listen to the bishop. Somebody who didn't just pay attention. Is there somebody tonight that just want to humble themselves? And crack the doors of heaven open. Because if you open up heaven. We ain't just talking about rain. I'm talking about for a time for you to make it in. When you stand before God on the day of judgment. Remember what you want to be saying. Well done good and faithful servant. What you don't want God to do is. Stand before God on the day of judgment. And God say well Do y'all get my grist? Whatever you've ever done in your life, no matter how bad, grace abounds. The one thing about grace, you see, the Bible is real slick. Remember when I told you about the type and shadow? The thing about grace, it brings rain. When the Bible said Noah found grace, that was God's way of saying, I'm ready to bring rain. Is there somebody that need a little bit of God's grace tonight? Let's stand. I want you to come up. You know, I, the pastor last night, he was so good. He talked about the earth and how people worship the earth and all that stuff. And I heard somebody say, well, you know, the day they got it is earth day. Ah! No, today is grace day. Today is rain day. And if there's anybody out there tonight, 
that realize, say, hey, I need some grace. I want you to come up on up to this altar right now. And everybody here, we will pray for you. Is there one that just know they need grace tonight? Thank you, honey. You open up heaven's door. You open up heaven's door. And here's somebody else opening up heaven's door. Somebody else has opened up heaven's door. Let me tell y'all something. Grace is the most beautiful thing. When Noah found grace, it rained, it poured. But Noah was just fine. And tonight in your life, no matter whatever thing may cause you to be up to the altar, it doesn't matter. Because once you go for grace and you reach out and you grab grace, oh, it rains in your life. It pours. It's that good kind of rain. It's that kind of rain that comes down and no matter whatever seed you've sown, if you've sown a financial seed, that seed starts sprouting when rain comes along. Show me a spiritual seed you've sown. That seed starts sprouting when it rains. Show me anything that you put your hand to that you have planted. That plant starts growing when it's rain. And grace opens up heaven. That's why he said, if my people call my name, will humble themselves. Or I will hear from heaven. Heaven may shut up. But if it does shut up and one person decides they're going to become humble... You open the doors. And tonight, you have opened the doors. Hallelujah. Apostle. Pastor Bobby, y'all. Come on, all of y'all. I turn the service over to you now.